Well, a U.S.-led coalition of 13 countries are issuing what is being called a final warning to the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels, vowing consequences if the terror group continues to attack ships in the Red Sea. Since no the, the 19th of November, there's been at least 23 Houthi attacks on commercial vessels. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby spoke about this yesterday. Here's what he had to say. Watch. As the president has made clear, the United States does not seek conflict with any nation or actor in the Middle East, nor do we want to see the war between Israel and Hamas widen in the region. But neither will we shrink from the task of defending ourselves, our interests, our partners, or the free flow of international commerce. Joining us now on set here in New York, retired two-star Marine Corps General, the Panaro Group CEO and author of the ever-shrinking fighting force, General Arnold Panaro, General, what a pleasure to have you here with us in New York today. Well, well Cheryl, such a privilege to be with you here on the set. It's yeah. a great, a great thrill for me personally. Yeah. John Kirby, look, he's got a tough job uh, trying to deal with an administration that has, let's say, honestly, has made a few mistakes when it comes to how they've dealt with Iran. Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah are not backing down. In fact, they seem more emboldened than ever, than ever in the Middle East. What is your response? Well, Cheryl, I think we're on the razor's edge of a significant escalation of the conflicts in the Middle East coming from both sides. And, and frankly, what I would say is, had we taken more decisive action against the Houthis early on when they first started that and tamped them down in their confines of where they are, uh, in Yemen, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. And of course, on our side, the U.S. and our allies have no alternative but to basically say, look, you can't keep this up. One of the things that I think based on, and of course, Iran yesterday is blaming the United States and Israel for the internal terrorist attack that had happened in their country on the fourth year anniversary of Soleimani's death, the architect of all the terrorism. A memorial for East. him, correct. At, at, at a memorial. Buried. But I mean, this guy is the number one exporter of terrorists, uh, uh, the mastermind, the evil puppeteer behind Hamas, the Houthis, Hezbollah, the Iranian uh, and Syrian pro uh, proxies. And so, uh, basically, uh, we should, one of the things I think we need to do right away is I would not be bringing the Ford Carrier Battle Group back home. I think we need to keep all the force we have in the region. We've got to try to deter this escalation. You're not going to deter it by basically uh, reducing the size of your capability in the region. Well, look, the head of Hezbollah did threaten Israel yesterday. You, you similar are mentioning this, but th that terror group is not afraid of war. Uh, there was a drone strike earlier in the week, and that killed the founder of Hamas's military wing in Beirut, which many are saying, good, that's positive. Uh, but Hezbollah's leader is calling the attack, quote, the flagrant Israeli aggression and a major dangerous crime, which cannot, we cannot be silent about. So, Sh rhetoric, Cheryl, I understand, but... What Cheryl, he was, just like Soleimani four years ago, he was an enemy combatant, a legitimate military target. Israel has got to take out Hamas's leaders wherever they are. And right. so, uh, again... Uh, They're in Qatar, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, we know where some of them are. Well, the, that's this, one was, in, this was, was in Lebanon. And, yeah. and uh, you know, we have a reach in, in during the, the Obama, the Trump, and the Biden administrations. We've been taking out terrorists uh, uh, by remote control, and Israel's doing the same thing. But I think we've got to really try to see if we can't take some serious steps to basically reduce this increased possibility of escalation because this is going to happen not just in Gaza but it's going to happen on many fronts. It could happen on the northern borders in Israel. I think we've seen over a hundred attacks on our own forces uh, in Iraq and Syria and we have not responded as forcefully as we should to deter those. Yeah. General, how much of this escalation do you believe is due to Biden's perceived weakness on the world stage? You've mentioned that we have not taken decisive action against these attacks on our troops and the Biden administration administration is also responsible for enriching Iran over the past couple of years um, by not enforcing oil sanctions. So how much of that has to do with his policies and is there a way that we can turn it around? I would focus, Kaylee, I would focus right now on what we have and have not done right in the Middle East rather than try to broaden it across the world. I mean, there's certainly we should be doing a lot more to deter Xi in Taiwan. We should have been doing a lot more. Iran right now has enough enriched uranium to build three nuclear weapons. That's a pretty scary situation. And so there are things we could do now. 
uh, particularly be more forceful in our deterring and our response to the attacks on our own forces, particularly keeping and beefing up our forces in the region so that if Hezbollah for some reason decides that they're going to escalate, then we have the ability to help Israel respond. So uh, I would keep it focused in that region, and certainly mistakes were made early on. We could correct those mistakes now, but the only way we're going to correct it is to be very forceful in terms of what our retaliatory responses would be. Mark. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess the question for you that I would have is, is how, how, how bad can this potentially get? I, I mean, things seem to be getting worse and worse and worse day by day. No, we have no resolution in Ukraine. Things in Israel and in Gaza are, are getting, it seems like we're not really making any progress there. How bad can things get? Well, actually, 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 Kaylee, that was actually, Mark, uh, you're right. It is broader. I mean, we're on the razor's edge in Ukraine. I mean, you know, we, we Taiwan, razor's edge. The border is so unsecure, and we aren't taking any steps. And the Congress is still on vacation. They should have come back and start working 24-7. They haven't passed the supplemental. They haven't passed funding for Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan. They haven't passed any additional security for the borders. And you're right. I mean, they should come back right now, 24-7, pass those supplementals, pass all the funding bills. They haven't passed the defense funding bill. And the CRs are getting ready to run out here in a couple of weeks. So, so Congress is a big yeah. part of this problem. No, we, we could potentially face another shutdown, to your point, uh, right. General. Before you go, today is January 4th, and today's date has significance for well, you. Well, thank you, Cheryl, for bringing that up. Uh, 54 years ago, January 4th, 1970, uh, I was a Marine Corps infantry platoon commander in the Quezon Mountains of Vietnam in an intense firefight with the North Vietnamese. I was given first aid to my Navy medic that had been hit, and then all of a sudden, I got hit by a sniper's bullet. The impact was so hard, it knocked me way down into a stream, and I was kind of laying out in the open with bullets quacking all around me. And a young Marine Corporal, Roy Hammonds of Texas, he'd been in Vietnam 12 and a half months, would be rotating home in a couple of weeks, dashed from a totally safe position to come help me and give me first aid. Uh, put his body between mine and the snipers, and unfortunately, he got hit. And while I was able to kind of drag both of us to a more safe position, uh, I tried to save his life, and I could not. So he was mortally wounded. Um, had it not been for him, uh, I would not be here today. So I'd just like to say, Semper Fidelis, Corporal Hammonds, thank you. I never forget, and, and to all the ones that serve in uniform in harm's way each and every day, protecting American citizens all over the world. Semper Fidelis. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And obviously, our, our thoughts are with his family, and we remember all of those lives that we have lost, but not just in Vietnam, but through the years. And I think before you go, I just have to ask you, we're still... Uh, we still have U.S. military uh, personnel under attack uh, around the world, in particular right now in the Middle East. How worried are you about our servicemen and women today? Look, our servicemen and women make the unbelievable sacrifices each and every day. We have people in the Middle East right now that are ready to go in and rescue our hostages. The opportunity came. We have, we have the people in the military today. If it escalates, unfortunately, uh, they're going to be uh, taking the fight and protecting our freedoms and our democracy. So, yes, we, I worry every day about the people in uniform because they're at risk every single day. General, it's always wonderful to have you. And thank you for your service, but also for being such a current voice in the conflicts that we are facing as a nation. Great to be here. All Thank right. you. General Arnold Pinar.